Good afternoon. Um, I'm Beverly Walker Grafia, as you know, uh, the president of Mont Community College. And we are here today uh, as a college to come together to talk about the murder of George Floyd. I'm sure you know, because it would be very difficult not to know uh, in the United States today what has been happening across our country. On May the 25th, uh, George Floyd, at that point, a person that was unknown, a 46-year-old African-American man, died in Minneapolis after being handcuffed and pinned to the ground by a white police officer. Bystanders captured video at that time of what was happening with the police officer's knee pinned to Mr. Floyd's neck. Mr. Floyd, throughout the video, is heard saying, I can't breathe. It continued on until he could breathe no more. The video spread quickly across social media and became a driving force for protests in Minneapolis. In Minneapolis on the 26th, tear gas was used to break up the protests and things continued on. The men that were involved um, with the death were fired. But when things were looked into, what was told about uh, with the police account of what happened bore little resemblance to what the video showed. And that's when things really changed for America. Because on May 27th, protests started erupting in cities across the US. Protests that led to at some points violence and sometimes looting. Here in Flint and Genesee County, we have had several protests by many different groups. And they've all been peaceful, and that has been a wonderful thing. But someone said in the suggestions that um, come to me for the communication, we need to hear from our faculty about what has happened and add uh, Chief Oded in so that we can really look at as a college, where do we go from here? Why did this happen? And can we really make change in America when we're talking about things that have happened historically for what I would say over 400 years? So today we have, uh, representing our faculty, several panelists. Mr. Rodney Barber, our math faculty, Dr. Dalton Connolly, social work technician program, coordinator, Mr. Brian Harding, history faculty, Dr. Brian Littleton, psychology faculty, Dr. Doreen McCrory, marketing faculty, Dr. Denise Polk, dental assistant coordinator, Ms. Haley Slade, criminal justice and corrections program coordinator, and it's featuring our MCC public safety chief, uh, Michael Odette. And so I've asked these people from various different perspectives to look at several different questions uh, to really start talking about what has happened, why it's happened, and where do we go from here. And so before we get started with the questions, I would like each person to give just a brief thought about what has happened right now in America. So we're gonna start with uh, Dr. Dalton Connolly from Social Work. Thank you, Dr. Beverly. Like most of you, um, I have been trying to understand um, how a white police officer could calmly and casually channel uh, the weight of his entire body through his knee on a black man's neck while that individual begged for his life uh, for over eight minutes. Um, it defies my ability to really grapple with that because 
that is not my experience with the police officers that I know. Um, the police officers that I am privileged to work with. But having said that, I know that that is um, many black folks, especially black men, everyday experience. Um, it is a reality for black people. I am pleased that uh, Mott Community College is here to talk about this, that we are addressing the issue head on like we do most things, um, and that we are going to talk about how we can respond and how we can address our biases, our prejudices, um, and not only how we can make Mott a better place to live and work, um, but all of our community. Haley Slade. Thank you, Dr. Beverly. And I just want to thank you, Dr. Beverly, for putting this together. Uh, much appreciated. And thank you to all my colleagues for being here as well and taking the time to do this. Um, as I was deciding what to say today, uh, I will tell you I struggled with how to put my feelings into words. Um, as many of you know, I have worn the badge before as a sworn officer and was always very proud of that. I can tell you it absolutely tears me apart to see incidents like this. I know that not all police officers are bad or racist as I've worked with many of them and still call many of them my closest friends today. However, I strongly believe that saying it's just one bad apple is really a cop out at this point. We all know that one rotten apple can spoil the whole bushel. And when we're talking about the power and the force of the police, one rotten apple is one too many. I think it's important to remember that although this conversa conversation today starts about George Floyd, uh, the incident was just the straw that broke the camel's back. Unfortunately, there are so many more names we could talk about. Breonna Taylor, Michael Brown, Laquan McDonald, Tamir Rice, Eric Garner, and the list goes on. This movement is so much bigger. In fact, we're talking about 400 years of institutionalized racism in our country. We as Americans are better than this, and I know that police officers must do better than this. And I think many of us can see that there is a problem. We have a problem here. Um, but when I talk about these conversations in my classes, I always make sure at the end that we talk about solutions because I think it's important uh, that we're forward thinkers and we think about the solutions to these issues. So I can tell you, and I may be slightly biased because I'm an educator, but I can tell you that I think one of the first solutions is through education. Uh, there's far too many police departments that still hire police officers with only a high school diploma. And I strongly feel that we should require an associate's degree, if not a bachelor's degree, in order to enter the police force. And some may say, well, why is that? Why is college so important? Because through college courses, students are exposed to people that are different than them. And for many of my students, it's the first time they've been exposed to people that are very, very different for them. College classes allows them to develop those critical thinking skills that are also important in policing and to develop that sense of empathy that is vital in policing. So my students often ask me, why did you leave policing? Didn't you like it? And I said, I loved it. I said, I had the chance every single day to change someone's life, to make it better. And there's not many jobs that have that opportunity. And they say, well, why did you leave? And I said, honestly, I became frustrated as a patrol officer because I saw things that I wanted to change. I knew changes needed to be made, and I couldn't do it in that role. And as I started working as an adjunct instructor, I realized where I can make a real difference in this profession is through education. If I can teach young students who want to be police officers something before they go into the profession, then I can make those changes that I saw that needed to happen. Here at Mott, uh, in our criminal justice program, I think it's important that people know we have a mandatory class uh, that all criminal justice students must take in ethics and criminal justice. 
I teach that class. That's my class. That's my baby. Uh, and we talk about these issues every day. I start the class off every class with a video from the media from the last five years about one of these incidents. And we look at it critically and we talk about what happened and the solutions. Uh, we highlight important topics like implicit bias, the Black Lives Matter movement, institutional racism, mass incarceration. I also know Chief Odette and Lieutenant Livingston do a phenomenal job in our Alerta Police Academy. Uh, they have always taught police ethics and they've always taught de-escalation techniques there. My goal for a graduate of Mott's Criminal Justice Program has always been that they develop critical thinking skills and empathy and that they know the value and importance of integrity in the criminal justice field. So I'll end with a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, his words are so relevant right now, right? You would think he was living with us today uh, if you read some of his words. This was from his letter from Birmingham jail. Uh, Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And this is why this Black Lives Matters movement does and should matter for all of us. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Haley. And I'm gonna ask that our uh, presenters, if they would read the chat. Denise, Dr. Pope. I would like to thank you first for inviting me to be a part of this panel. This um, situation hits close to home because I've had someone who has been assaulted by a police officer. Um, that's one of the reasons why um, the, I view police officers a certain way. My father told us to always be respectful. And even in the respect that you give to police officers, sometimes things don't go as you think they would. But in those particular situations, you still have to remain um, calm and respectful at all times. Um, we had a, one of my uncles was killed by a police officer. So that's why, you know, this touched home. And one of the questions that was brought up talked about why does this strike a chord? I won't get into that now, but that's why it struck a chord is because I, you know, I didn't know my uncle personally, but I was taught of him my entire life by my father. And also, you know, I taught my sons and they taught, my son taught his sons. And so, you know, we look at this and we try to think of what can we do as a family, as a society, in order to keep people safe and to always think of how we're going to approach someone, how we're going to deal with situations as they, as they occur. So with that, we always think to be respectful for everyone. And I teach all of my students, use your thoughts first, think things out, even if it has to be quickly. Don't be so quick to judge someone and don't be so quick to jump to a conclusion and always try to de-escalate a situation. Um, I think nowadays people are so hot-headed and the, it goes back to police officers too. They have to learn how, and they should be taught in their training how to de-escalate a situation before it gets to a point where someone is harmed. And so that, with that, I would leave that and, you know, training our students to be the best people that they can be and also to carry on that message that they have to train someone and they have to take on that responsibility and help to teach someone also. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Doreen, Dr. McCrory. Hi. With Dr. Beverly, I also want to thank you for the invitation to participate in this panel. You know, one of the things that really stood out, and I also want to commend you for, was the letter, the open letter that you sent to the campus on June 1st, denouncing the horrific murder of George Floyd. What we've seen is that a lot of companies and institutions didn't say anything, didn't make a statement initially. But you made a statement early on about my position and our commitment to diversity and inclusion, especially for the students and the community that we serve. And that's extremely important to know that right away, you as the president sent out a letter saying that this was our stance and that we are a community and that we need to uh, treat each other with respect. This topic is extremely personal to me. 
because one thing I have to start with is that I am unapologetically Black. I am a Black woman. I am a mother for Black sons and daughters. I'm married to a Black man. I was raised with three Black male older brothers. So the conversation that we have in right now, unfortunately, we have had to have many times because we've lost people that we love and care about because due to police brutality. With that being said, it's not saying that all police are bad because we also have family members that are in law enforcement as well. But we need to hold those that are doing the bad things and doing the wrong things and abusing their power accountable. You know, we had, as a family, had to have a conversation years ago on what to do if you were stopped by the police. And it's not just support black men because black women are dying as well. And when, when I was coming up, we were taught that if you're stopped by the police, you go into the glove compartment and you get your, show your license, your registration and your proof of insurance. So when I had kids, that's what I taught them. But there are people that are dying because they're reaching for a proof of insurance and the assumption is made that they're criminal and they're reaching for a weapon. So there had to be just a paradigm shift and not just the way that you, we, that I and parent and live, but the way that we had to adjust and modify to the set of circumstances that are happening that are beyond our control. Another thing that I wanted to add was when we talk about the Black Lives Matter movement, we have never said that all lives didn't matter. All lives matter. But what is extremely important to pay attention to is that there is a crisis going on with the, in, within the African American community that needs a special attention because it's a crisis and it has gotten out of control. So no one is saying that all lives don't matter. That is a given because humanity is sacred. It should be for all. Unfortunately, those of us in the black community haven't always gotten that same respect, right? Or that or shown that our lives are valuable. And lastly, one of the things I wanna talk about too, because it's very discerning to hear when they compare peaceful protesters to looters. There's a very different, those are very different groups of people with different agendas. So as we see those peaceful protests going on around the world, as Dr. Beverly mentioned, the peaceful protests in Flint, we have some people that wanna compare those actions or people that are showing their emotion and comparing them to looters when the majority of the people don't fit in that category. So I just wanted to put those things out there first before we started our dialogue because we want to recognize and show that we do respect that all lives matter. This, the abuse and the death of black males and black people dying at the hands of police have been, has been occurring at disproportionate rates than with other communities and that we respect those police that are doing a good job and we value them and we know that you are out there putting your life on the line, but so are we just being black in America today. So thank you. Thank you. The next we have is uh, Mr. Brian Harding. Brian. Thank you, Dr. Beverly. I wish to speak for a few minutes on the, this painful history that we have in this country. What happened to George Floyd is not an isolated incident, violence, upon Black people and African-American opposition to that injustice are both themes that run consistently throughout the entirety of the history of the United States. The first police force in the United States were slave patrols, first created in the Carolina colony in 1704, quickly copied throughout the South, where about 90% of Black Americans lived at the time. The patrols were a volunteer force consisting of armed men who monitored and attacked Black people and anyone who tried to help them escape slavery. The police, in other words, were a state-sponsored terrorist organization designed specifically to protect white ownership of black bodies. These slave patrols then became the police departments of the U.S. South following the Civil War. Their job then began to, became to control the agricultural labor force as of African Americans as freedmen and women and to deny their uh, equal rights under the law. The police Brian, can you speak up just a little? We're having a hard time hearing you. I'm sorry, I will. The, uh, the police were complicit in the gang, in the gang system of coerced labor. Uh, accurately described as worse than slavery and as nine kinds of hell, 
as one black man who survived the chain gang described it. The Ku Klux Klan was, at a minimum, an auxiliary organization for Southern police departments. This remained in place, for the most part, right up to the civil rights movement of the 1960s. There was a notable exception, however, for about 15 to 20 years following the Civil War, there was notable black political power in much of the South, including black police officers, though this was beaten back by white supremacists by around 1880. As for the North, the first police force was created in Boston in 1838, and it was copied quickly throughout the North following there. Their purpose was to control disorder, in particular immigrants and people of color. Both groups at the time were deemed to be biologically inferior and morally inferior to native-born white Americans and inherently prone to criminality. It was in the mid-19th century that northern metropolitan police forces began to adopt an idea that rather than reacting to crime, they could prevent crime from taking place in the first place uh, by monitoring these so-called dangerous classes. Thus began, began the hyper-surveillance and under-protection of black people in the urban north. And in the 21st century, New York City stopped and frisk. African Americans were barred from working, mostly, from working as police officers uh, until the 1970s. And it should not be forgotten that police forces throughout the United States acted to, su to suppress the civil rights movements unsuccessfully. One thing, though, is clear. Ours is a history in which Black Americans far too often feel like a colonized people in their own country, in which their bodies and their lives have little value. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Thank you, Brian. Now we have Dr. Uh, Brian Littleton. Brian. Oh, um, Thank you, Dr. Buffy, for allowing me to speak. Um, just to kind of make this a little bit more personal, because um, to be honest, uh, when I first got invited to even speak, I wasn't even sure if I can do it. Um, it's a lot of emotion that I'm going through as a black male to see this repeatedly over again. Um, but I spoke to a student uh, a few days ago in my class, and I'm, we we're talking about homework, but there's another uh, young black, uh, black male and we were just discussing this, and he just talked about the mental exhaustion and, you know, what it means to be a black male. It's like, how can I even focus on school? How can I focus on anything that even matters? Um, I'm going to school to get my degree and thinking that's going to protect me from racism. And it was just so a heavy conversation that, you know, just listening to him and talking to him. And so I began to do a lot of thinking about, like, how do we get here? Um, why has this always been? And it goes back to looking at the institutions itself, the policies that were created um, that just don't see Black people as humans, as being equal and deserving of their humanity. And so it's just, it's very heavy. And I just think about, um, again, just the students I'm working with and just Black people all over. But at the same time, I also feel optimistic. Um, I see the protests, I see the uprising and people pushing back and really trying to change some of these institutions. Uh, it's a lot of work, but I, I do, for the first time, I'm, I am optimistic. I feel that something different will happen this time and hopefully we can begin to start seeing some change. Thank you. And Mr. Rodney Bar Barber, Rodney? It's, um interesting things that a man other folks have already mentioned like uh brian harding mentioned a certain a number of things pertaining to the history um i was going to mention things about the slave codes and after the slave codes um you had put into the law um the clan and lynching to control blacks on up to uh the Tulsa incident, and after the Tulsa incident, things going on up to um, the sit-ins that were, that Black people tried to institute during the 40s, 50s, and the uh, 60s. Now, um, one of the questions uh, you submitted was um, the difference between what happened to Floyd, George Floyd, and the Tulsa incident. Now, the thing about that, the, well, the Tulsa incident was a flat-out massacre 
and what happened to George Floyd was the same thing that we've seen happen in a number of different ways over the last 15 years. We've seen many individual Blacks, um, Black men and Black women killed by the police. Um, but the difference between their being killed and George Floyd is when they were killed, they were shot, something that happens quickly. With George Floyd, eight minutes, 46 seconds. Um, when the funeral was held in Minneapolis, they uh, paused for eight minutes, 46 seconds. At the end of one of the shows on MSNBC Saturday, they, the last nine minutes of the show, they said, okay, they had a counter going down eight minutes, 46 seconds. And at the time he stopped moving, which I think was the last three minutes, 46 seconds, the screen went black and it was just the counter moving. And the thing about that extended period of essentially, you could call it his execution, that in of itself, that was the horrible thing, watching a slow execution with someone crying out, I can't breathe, someone crying out for his mother. And, you know, that's uh, that in of itself, and the repeated showing of that. Uh, over and over and over again, literally every hour on television, that's a horrible thing to see. And it has affected me, and I'm sure everyone else who watched that deeply, very deeply. So and that's about all I'm going to say at this moment. Thank you, Mr. Barber. Uh, Chief Odette, Michael? Thank you, Dr. Beverly, and thank you all so much for the opportunity to participate in this critical conversation today. I deeply regret that we are faced once again with a divisive incident that was sparked by the actions of a police officer. I've dedicated 26 years of my life to this community, and I've never been more filled with the spirit to help my fellow members of this community than I am today. I know many of you don't know who I am, uh, I know that trust for law enforcement is at an all-time low. I fully anticipate some difficult questions, some that I may not be able to answer, some that may make me feel very uncomfortable. But this conversation has to happen. It's got to take place if we want to make systemic change. And I'm very happy uh, to step up and say, let that change begin with me, with us here at my community college. So... Thank you again, and I look forward to open and honest dialogue with all of you today. So as we get started, um, each panelist will be asked uh, a question. They'll have about two to three minutes to answer the question. As we're going through, I'll also be looking to see if there are questions that you have submitted uh, to the email uh, that I believe that is out there for you to submit questions. And so as we are having this discussion, we will filter those in as well. Um, I, we've done a little bit about historical already. So I'm, I'm going to talk about, I guess, what we've all just laid out here, the death of George Floyd. And so I, I guess my, my very first question, I'm going to go to uh, Denise Polk. Um, Dr. Polk, was the death of George Floyd murder? I would say yes. When murder occurred, when George Floyd lost consciousness, George Floyd was alive and pleading for his life for approximately five minutes. And then after that time, he lost consciousness. We all know in medicine that it takes approximately three to six minutes in order to lose consciousness from uh, hypoxia. So he, his brain is not receiving oxygen. At that point, when he lost 
his consciousness. He was handcuffed, you know, had his hands handcuffed behind him, lost consciousness. He could not fight anymore. He could not move anymore. He could not breathe anymore. Yet the police officer did his knee into his neck and applied all of his weight onto his body. In that instant, then now it's murder because he did not think to let up enough pressure and to try to resuscitate and to bring this man back to life and to let him have a chance in order to live. So yes, I do believe that this was murder in this particular case. And the police had to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt, I'm not an attorney and I'm not you know, in law enforcement, but I know that you have to prove within, without a shadow of a doubt before you can charge someone with such a crime. And the evidence showed that the, the police officer had no remorse. When you look at that tape of him and you look at his face, he had no remorse in what he was doing. So in that case, I would say, yes, that was murder. So Chief Odette, a lot of people that have watched this video over and over again, um, find it's really clear cut that Mr. Floyd was murdered. Why do you think it took so long to charge the police officers with murder? Well, there's no, there's no good answer to be honest with you. Um, th there's no excuse as to why those, those officers weren't charged immediately. Um, I, I can tell you that if the same event occurred and the, that officer was not wearing a uniform, there was more than enough probable cause established by that video that an arrest should have been made. There, there's, really no, there's really no excuse as to why it should have been. Um, having some experience and understanding of how the system works I can give you um, some ideas as to why it may have taken a little bit of time. Um, I'm sure that um, they had more than enough information at the very beginning. Uh, they immediately fired the officers. So at the very least, uh, the police department knew that they violated the department policies and procedures. My guess is that uh, through the investigation, uh, the investigation went to the prosecutor's office who wanted as much information as that, that they possibly could have um, in order to determine what charges should be filed. Interestingly, after the arrest was made, they amended the charges. Um, so um, the system takes time. Um, if, if you go through the prosecutor's office before making the arrest, um, obviously they want to have all the information they can possibly get before determining what charges they will, will bring against the individual. Uh, in my opinion, um, there was, again, more than enough probable cause based on the, the video by itself um, that an arrest should have been made. And again, they knew early on that something was wrong because they fired him immediately based on violations of department policy procedure. Um, but there really is no good excuse as to what took so long. So, uh, Dalton, Dr. Conley, uh, why do you think George Floyd's death, well, well, what caused the death of George Floyd? Was it bias? Was it racism? Was it hate? What was it? What, what do you think was going on here? The word racism is everywhere. Um, it's used to explain things that cause African American suffering and death, um, inadequate access to health care, food, housing, jobs, or a police bullet or baton or knee. But racism fails to fully capture what Black people in this country are facing. Black scholars, many of them are using a new term anti-blackness um anti-blackness is one way um 
that scholars have articulated what it means to be marked as black in an anti-black world. I think that this term is probably a more accurate description. Um, you know, the experience of black people as they walk through this world is very different from other people of color. Um, I think that racism oversimplifies um, uh, what it is that black people experience on, on a daily basis. Um, Anti-blackness is a theoretical framework that eliminates society's inability to recognize African-American humanity. Um, Bias affects police work um, and the mistrust that many communities of color feel towards the, the police. Um, there's a Stanford psychologist, uh, Eberhardt, who found that there is actually a dehumanizing factor that plays a role in the psychological association between race and crime. Um, not only in police interactions, but in criminal court cases as well. Um, one of the things that she found was that when she would show pictures to police officers, um, that there was automatically uh, a, a different association to black faces versus other faces. Um, what she has done to address that is, uh, is something that I, I can really appreciate is to revert um, or to train the police officers to revert to actually um, what their training is, which is science. Is there enough evidence? Like make them physically ask that question. Is there enough evidence? Um, to go through with this stop. Uh, they tried this in Oakland and there was a 43% reduction in African Americans um, being pulled over in, in 2018. It's just one thing that contributes to or illustrates the fact that black people in this country are treated differently. So in answer to the question, is it racism? No, I don't think it is. Um, I don't think it's bias because when bias or, or is it hate? You know, bias is part of hate. There's actually something called the pyramid of hate that begins with biased attitudes, acts of bias, systemic discrimination, and then bias motivated violence, and then genocide. All of those things um, were involved. And you can see that the same day that George Floyd uh, was murdered, Amy Cooper, um, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but she threatened uh, Christian Cooper um, because he asked her simply to muzzle her dog in Central Park. And her response was, I'm going to call the police and tell them that an African-American threatened to kill me. That's, I mean, you can't get any more of a clear example of bias and, um, and hate um, towards towards uh, uh, black people. Um, so I think our understanding of what it is that we are dealing with is evolving. It's being pushed by black scholars, thankfully, because they're the ones that need to be speaking about their experiences um, and the experiences uh, of black people. Thank you. Dr. Rafia. Yes. May I follow up on the, the question you asked Michael Odette? 
Sure. Um, Mr. Odette, what role do police unions play in how fast or how slow uh, a person is charged or a policeman is charged with um, committing a crime because police unions have a major effect on the um, charge that goes through or whether uh, a policeman is convicted of certain charges. I, I would agree with you 100%. Um, this is a topic that uh, may not be popular in this community because it's a very strong union community, but I would agree with you. I think that one of the pitfalls uh, that we have involving these type of situations are the strength of the police unions. Um, there's been many times where there have been officers that probably should have been fired. And because of the strength of the union, they've been able to retain their job and later on ended up being fired for other reasons or for the same reason. So I would agree that um, the unions do play a, a, a large role in that. Um, and I think that at times can be too powerful. And, and there should there there have been a lot of times where there have been officers that should have been let go. Um, and because of the union was able to retain their jobs. So I'm going to shift the conversation just a little bit. Uh, in talking with uh, my niece the other night, uh, she talked about uh, this starting with Emmett Till and maybe Till showing the body of her um, battered son. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. This, this, this has started since the beginning of our time here. So, uh, Brian, can, can you talk about why we find that African Americans have been treated with this inhumane treatment really since we arrived in 1619? Well, that's a good question. And I, I do agree with you, Dr. Beverly, that uh, African Americans have been treated in this inhumane system since the beginning in 1619. And the short answer I would say is that white supremacy cannot be perpetuated simply through ideology. A people, like black people, who are committed to enjoying the blessings of liberty in this country that they themselves built and their ancestors through their blood and their sweat, it will not and cannot be controlled only through, uh, only through ideology. Violence, terror, these are the instruments with which white supremacy is and has always been maintained. Uh, we mentioned Tulsa in 1921, but I can tell you similarly horrific stories of Cincinnati in 1829, New York City in 19, 1863, New Orleans in 1866, Cushada, Louisiana, 1874, Wilmington, North Carolina, 1898, Atlanta in 1906, Chicago in 1919, Detroit in 1925, and again in 1943. And that's not even a fifth of the list that I could uh, give you. So this country needs to take a good hard look at itself. And that was true 200 years ago, and it was true 100 years ago, and it was true 50 years ago, and it remains true today. There's periods in history in which, and it ebbs and flows, but there are periods in history in which white men feel they have a license to kill black people with impunity. So, uh, Doreen, Dr. McCory. Um, African-American parents uh, teach their children, or they try to teach them, you know, how not to get killed. Uh, I think you talked about that. You alluded to that. Um, I had the same experience growing up. I had an older brother, and so uh, he was much older than myself, and, and I heard the instruction that he received, and, and then, you know, I followed in his footsteps of what to do and what not to do and how to hold your hands. And when you go into the, gro you know, any store, how you keep your hands up so people can see them so they don't think that you're stealing. And, and I imparted that to my son as well. So, so we've been trying to teach our children really how not to get killed. But sometimes that doesn't work. 
So what do you do if you've done everything you've been taught and the officers are still aggressive with you? Before I answer that, can I go back to when you asked the questions about what killed George Floyd? Yeah. And one thing yeah. I would like to say, it was a, it's a blatant, it's hatred one, and a blatant disregard for Black life. And the fact that when we talked about the police officers and the, how long it took for them to be charged, one of the things that we know is that there are so many officers, this isn't new, as Haley mentioned earlier, and there are so many officers that don't get charged and there is no penalty or consequence for their actions. So one of the things, even in Minneapolis, they have a history of police brutality where the police officers were never held accountable for their action. So this could have been, if it weren't for the video, another circumstance where someone died and no consequence would have been um, given to those that caused that horrific, horrific, cold-blooded, callous murder within, when the officer had his hands in his pocket. The other thing I wanted to just um, refer back to when Dalton, you were talking about um, ideology and the scholars and also looking at the evidence. But one of the things I want to remind um, a lot of people that's at top of mind for us and why so many Black people right now are feeling the way that they do is that there are Black people that were killed where there was no crime. There was no evidence that needed to be evaluated. We can look at Botham John that was killed in his apartment. He was in his own apartment and the police officer came there. We can look at Breonna Taylor. We can look at, there's so many names and that we can mention that there was no need to look for evidence because there was no crime in the first place. So when we start to talk about where we are today and the history that we have, this country was built on hate. We were, when you, Dr. Beverly, you mentioned, you know, 16, 19 and the 400 years of, of the history that we have here, where we were colonized, we were stolen from our country, kidnapped, raped, had in bondage, and we were um, lynched for sport. Even after the Revolutionary War, we were still only considered three-fifths human. So no, at that, not even at that time with the new constitution that we, where we looked at as whole. So when you start to look at the way in our mistreatment, it was because they didn't look at us as human beings. Right, and then we talk about the Civil War and we, uh, the Confederate flag. Why people are so angry or anxious? My son goes to school in the South. When we look at the Confederate flag, it's because the Confederate War was based on the people in the South wanting to keep the blacks enslaved, and so that is what the Confederate flag means to us and the hate that we continue to see. And so when we start to think about what we do and what we say as parents today. First thing that I'm fortunate enough, my mother was born in 1935 and she's still with us, but I got and continue to get a history lesson on what's happened and those ills that have plagued our community for our entire existence here, right? And so as a parent, I definitely pray, right? We definitely pray. But we have the conversations, I had the conversations with my children about what to do. The number one thing that I need for them to understand is that their life is extremely important and they need to make it home. After the fact that we can try to, we'll take on um, additional um, action to address the misappropriation of the authority that was acted against them. But we have to let them know that they do matter, that their life does matter, and that there are things that they can do. To, we can try to mitigate the risk, but we do know that there are police officers that because of the color of our skin, before I, you see you, I do anything, you see me as a black person. My son is seen as a black male. It doesn't matter what kind of car he's driving, it doesn't matter the speed limit, that he could be stopped just because he's driving and being who he is. And we have to have conversations about that that's true and that that happens. And what I would like to continue to see is that when we talk about those implicit biases, that we also need the law enforcement officers to 
call out their own colleagues that are acting inappropriately. In addition to the police union that may support officers and keep them, helping them to keep their job, we also have people that are complicit and don't say anything when they see inappropriate behavior. So we do need to work together. And I don't let um, my children and the family members just give up and think that this is the way that it has to be just to live in America. We deserve better. And this inappropriate treatment has to end. So we've had protests around the world. And I guess I'm, I'm wondering why has, why has this, you know, Mr. Floyd's death really sparked this movement that's resonated across the world. And so, uh, Mr. Barbara Rodney, what are your thoughts about that? Well, the main thing I believe has caused um, people around the world to take note of this is, uh, again, we have had a lot of killed, but they may have been killed with a, a gun, you know, a policeman shoots, uh, that's a real fast uh, situation. I mean, the what, 12 year old boy, Tamir Rice was shot, uh, there have been women who were shot, uh, Breonna Taylor was shot in her apartment, but when you're pulling a trigger, that happens real fast. Floyd took a long time to die. And just a shot of, you know, eight minutes, 46 seconds. Um, now, every time I saw the video on TV, they never really showed the whole time. They showed pieces of the time. So when they were saying, well, eight minutes, 46 seconds, um, when Al Sharpton did the funeral and he had everyone stop for eight minutes, 46 seconds. And like I said, on MSNBC, near the end of one of the hour shows, they gave nine minutes at the end and said, well, this, these last nine minutes, we're going to count down or count up to eight minutes, 46 seconds. That's a long, long time. So it drives home this slow death process that occurred with this man. And I think that's uh, the horror of that has hit um, a lot of folks. And I think it, in particular, has hit a lot of uh, young folks because, well, the generation now, generation whatever it is, X or whatever they call it, um, people have a certain number of black friends, or white kids have a certain number of black friends, and, and that hits them hard. And this, and the people who were out uh, initially protesting, there were a lot of young people out there an awful lot of young people. I mean, really all generations were mixed in, but an awful lot of young people out there, I think that kind of spearheaded a lot of them. And um, I think that's what spread things around the world to England, to Germany, to New Zealand, Australia, um, because people in those countries, they're oppressed people in those countries that have the same issue. Um, Aborigines in Australia, um, I forget what the name of the group is in New Zealand, um, a lot of folks in uh, England. Um, so people identify with oppression in various countries because they've gone through oppression themselves historically. Oh, by the way, uh, Mr. Barber, that's the uh, Maori of New Zealand. Oh, you're right. Yeah. And uh, oh, by the way, and I agree with you, not only is it that everyone in this interconnected world can see what happened, 
to Mr. Floyd and how obviously wrong and unjust and immoral that it was. But like you said, it also connects to local conditions around the world. Police violence is an American problem, but it's not exclusively by any means. Uh, the protest in Tokyo uh, that took place recently, for instance, uh, it was absolutely inspired in solidarity with Mr. Floyd, but also because, uh, if I recall correctly, there was police violence against uh, a man in Tokyo who I believe is from a country in Southwest Asia, I forgot which. But okay. absolutely, this is a global, global problem. So, uh, Brian, Dr. Littleton, do you believe we can stop racist behaviors from occurring, or is this just a part of living in the U.S.? So, I believe that it, it is possible, uh, but it requires a deep level of introspection and um, for people to really examine policies and institutions. Are, um, are people going to be willing to give up power? Uh, and that requires a lot. Uh, when we talk about deconstructing institutions, you're seeing now people are discussing defunding the police department and what that radically looks like. And that's a radical change. That's the police institution, they feel like cannot be reformed. And I know a lot of people think uh, defunding, it means there's no police. What they're really talking about is spending money on the front end on education, healthcare, the things that creates these discrepancies um, that you have in the communities and then treat, uh, then have police on the back end. And I know that people look at, well, what about police deterrent? That's why we have so many police because they deter uh, crime maybe. Well, that is a one theory, but there's also, could also argue that maybe we can prevent crime from certain crimes, particularly low level, because we do a lot of policing of things that we probably don't need to police. I mean. We have one of the, high, the highest incarceration rate in the world. And there's something wrong with that, that we're spending more money on corrections. We're going through budget shortfalls, and I don't want to get political, but we're cutting education, but we got all this money going to our correction and police. Something's wrong. And so I believe that we can begin to make changes, but it's going to require us to really look at these institutions as being different and see them as something different. And it requires a lot of work. It won't come overnight. Um, it is going to be gradual and incremental, but I believe that we are taking, I believe, some of the first steps. So, uh, Ms. Slade, Haley, uh, how do we make a sustained change? How do, how do we have something that really brings on the change that will stop these types of incidents? Well, I think, you know, just as the problem is not, you know, one dimensional, very multifaceted, uh, the solution is as well. You know, we've talked, um, multiple uh, people here today have talked about how this has been going on in our country, you know, forever since it um, began, since the inception. So I think, um, you know, that the solution is complicated as well, but I think there's also little things we can do. We can't just say that it's so complicated, we're not going to do anything. Um, I talked about my opening education. I think that's huge. I think we need to have minimum education requirements for all police officers. And I'm not just saying that to recruit to my program, maybe a little bit, but no, I think uh, we should require, you know, associate's degrees or bachelor's degrees. Um, we need to have mandatory training standards, um, you know, within our police academies. I think the governor has already passed a bill recently talking about, you know, implicit bias training, de-escalation, um, communication skills, that's huge. Um, it has to be ongoing training for a police officer. So, you know, a police officer goes to their police academy at age 24, with well, 20 years in their career, they can't just have relied on that training. You know, it's got to be constant training, you know, going through scenario-based training uh, with de-escalation take techniques, I think is super important. Having the officers actually um, do real hands-on training with those types of scenarios. Um, voting. Uh, we know that uh, many of our populations um, in our minority communities, the voting level is very, very low. We got to hold our politicians accountable as well. I think people forget that we don't just vote for president. Some of the most important elections that we have are our local elections. The prosecutor, they charge police officers. That's what they do. And you have the ability to vote for your county prosecutor, your county sheriff, right? Uh, your local judges that sit on um, your circuit courts, right? All those people have the ability to hold some of these officers accountable. So I think 
getting more people politically involved um, is super important. Um, transparency in police departments. Uh, we have to have more citizen review boards, get citizens more involved in the whole police department process. Um, show them the hiring process. Maybe we have them involved in um, you know, final approval of hiring new police officers. Um, accountability within departments. We talked a little bit about unions, right? We can't have these officers um, be allowed to kind of hide behind those union lines. Um, so often in police departments, they've held together with this brotherhood, this sisterhood, right, where they don't tell on each other, uh, well, that has to stop, right? That has to end. Um, we have to hold our brothers and sisters accountable to make us all better, right? Because we don't want to be held to the standard of one bad officer and be judged by that person. So we need to, you know, get rid of that idea that we're hiding behind this kind of veil of secrecy, um, you know, of the thin blue line um, of police departments. And we have to find a way finally to build trust with police departments and police officers. This will never work, this society, if we continue this us versus them mentality. It's never going to work. You can't fight force with force. Um, and I've talked a lot about it in, in my classes. Um, community policing is huge, right? If you want to try and solve a problem within the community, go to the community, right? Listen to them. Listen to what they're saying to you um, and work on some of these solutions together so that we can try and bridge that gap between the community and the police. Dr. Grafia, may I add something to what she said? Sure. I think one thing that's had a major effect on people around the world, uh, and of course people in this country, is when you see the police lined up with their batons, their shields, and when you've seen a lot, lot of instances where they're charging folks using the baton, the pepper spray, um, that has an effect because the, the people out there are black and white. And I know for white America, looking, out, looking at these scenes saying, wait a minute, they, they, these folks are pepper spraying my kid. And that has a major effect in terms of, as they say, having skin in the game. And I think that's uh, another reason why this has affected more people in this country as around the world. It's um, not just uh, like more, more so during the 60s. It was like a lot of Black protests. And when the police interacted, Blacks were getting the brunt of uh, the beatings. I mean, you, you see any number of scenes on TV where, I mean, they're, they're really clubbing a lot of white people to death. I mean, the old 75-year-old guy in Buffalo, he's 75 years old, where they uh, mossed and pushed him back, and he killed another, but that was because they pushed him back and didn't really uh, help him. Might have called on the mic for help, but And I think just, just those reactions by the police has had a major effect on protests continuing. So I've got two questions here, uh, Chief, that I'm going to put together. Uh, one, is, one is from me, and then one is from a student that's watching. Uh, so it struck me that two of the officers that are charged had been on the job less than a week. And they said that they said, to the officer with the knee on, you shouldn't do that. But that was about as far as it went. So I'm asking, what are we teaching in LERTA that combats these types of behaviors where newbies feel like they can tell the mature senior officers if they're doing something that's they have been taught is not right. I'm going to 
could that though with a question from a student that says, what is MCC's response to police brutality and racial injustice on campus? As a student, what should I know about these responses? Okay, can I have more than two minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so basic police academies on average last between 17 to 20 weeks long. Some of the people that go to these academies don't have any prior training. They have no prior college. This is what they get. They get 17 to 20 weeks. If they're hired by a police department and sent to the academy, they don't necessarily have to have any education uh, other than a high school diploma. So they last 17 to 20 weeks. They're cram packed with so much information that at times it can be overwhelming. Um, they truly are the basic level of instruction for new police officers. Uh, the bulk of their training comes after they've graduated from the police academy, academy and they head off to their own police department where they go through the field training segment of their career. This is like the on the job training. Um, and this varies from department to department, um, you know, depending on where you end up, where you end up working. Um, so this new officer gets teamed up with a veteran field training officer who's charged with training this new officer uh, during real-time incidents. Now, during the academy, the recruits are trained uh, in numerous areas that would combat this type of behavior. Uh, they're trained in fair and impartial as well as unbiased policing. They're trained in the 21st century policing philosophy, which was implement implemented by President Obama. They're trained in cultural diversity, verbal defense and influence, ethics and policing, mental illness, as well as on use of force, on excited delirium and positional asphyxia, application of subject control and mechanics of arrest, as well as laws of arrest and laws pertaining to civil rights and human relations. So they get a lot of training at the academy level. Again, it's all crammed in with a bunch of other stuff. I think we do a pretty good job in the state of Michigan at setting the groundwork uh, for the new officers in the basic academies like LERDA. If you look at the challenge coin that we provide each of the graduates from LERDA on graduation day, you'll find these words engraved on one side. Integrity, unbiased service, and respect. I think where the problems may lie is when these young, new, and impressionable police officers go off to their individual departments and they try to fit into the culture of that agency. Now, the culture in many departments um, around here, around the country, especially in the first few weeks that these new officers are on the department, is for the rookie officer to just sit back, keep their mouth shut, shout, and observe. Um, I'm not sure if this is the case in Minneapolis. I'm not that familiar with that department. But regardless, we as a profession have to do a better job at intervening when we see somebody doing something unlawful or unethical, no matter how much time we have on the job. That's something that we have to change. There can be no blue coat of silence. We've got to do our right and our part to ensure that the rights of everybody that we're policing are protected. Now, specifically to Mott Community College, um, I'm new here. I've been here about 85 days. I'm unaware of any issues that we've had historically. Um, my predecessor has done a wonderful job of, of putting together a team of, of officers here that um, reflect our community. It's a diverse department. Um, they're all well-trained and well-educated. Um, we spend a lot of time, um, as I'm told, on a yearly basis, training in de-escalation and training in ethics and policing and training in unbiased policing. Um, we have a, a use of force policy. So in the event that any officer uses force on campus, whether it is handcuffing or discharging a firearm, at any level of force that's used uh, by a police officer um, of the Mott Community College Public uh, Safety Department, they have to complete a use of force report. Um, there is an annual review that's done yearly by the chief um, to review all the uh, incidents that involved force. Uh, any violations, obviously, uh, by a member of the department is dealt with through training um, and up to and including discipline. 
Uh, on a monthly basis, we are a part of a voluntary reporting program. And so every month we report to the Federal Bureau of Investigations the force that we use. Um, I'm proud to say that since I've been here, we have had no incidents of force. It's been an empty camp desk, empty camp desk but, but historically, and I've looked at the numbers um, you know, over the last few years, and we've had very little issues here at my community college, but we do take it very seriously. Um, I'm proud to say that there are 21 accredited agencies in Michigan. Um, we're one of those 21, and we happen to be the only one that's a, a community college that's accredited through the state of Michigan. So that means we follow best practices in the industry, and we take all of these topics very seriously and train on it regularly. So I'm going to stay with you because you end it with another question okay. that's here. Are public police agencies able to become accredited and what changes, if any, would this make? Yes. Um, any law enforcement agency in the state of Michigan, and I'm going to only refer to the state of Michigan because that's what my knowledge is limited to. I'm sure other states have similar accreditation uh, processes, but in the state of Michigan, all law enforcement agencies have the ability to become accredited. Um, there is, I believe it's 109 standards that have been established by the accreditation agency of Michigan that you have to meet. And so you have to have policy and procedure or work or rules in place to govern how your agency is going to handle various scenarios, um, what equipment you have to use that all equate to the best practices in the industry. Um, it is an expensive endeavor. Um, that's one thing that um, eliminates some departments from trying to participate in it. It's a lot of work. Um, I, I give a credit again to my predecessor and to all the men and women um, of this department that work so diligently to get the, the department accredited because it is a lot of work. Um, but yes, uh, the answer, the short answer is yes, any public agency can. And it does, um, again, it requires best, practice, best practices to be implemented, which ultimately is going to have um, an influence on the way that your agency polices. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to ask uh, three of the panelists to answer this. I'm going to hold Doreen because I, I don't want you to jump in on this question because I have another one for you that's tied to this question. So the question is, since white Americans have the greatest economic and political power in this country, it seems clear that they also have the greatest responsibility to force change. In your opinions, how can black Americans help white Americans understand their personal experiences so that we can eliminate our institutional racism. Who wants to start? I'll start, Dr. Beverly. <laughs> it starts with a conversation. You know, you have to educate the person that you're speaking with as to the best you can as to what your experiences are and how you can, they can help in you know, ch channeling those experiences. So until you have a conversation about it and understand, let that person understand what you're going through and how they can possibly help and also give them some direction as to you know, what they may do to help. Um, I think that's the first step in starting it. Anybody else? So, so I'll go, I, I guess I can chime in briefly. Um, one of the things that we can do um, is by having a conversation with those individuals, start with the conversation, but they have to be willing to learn um, because that is not, I don't feel that is Black America's burden to continually to provide the education. The education is out there. Um, we know the history, they have to do the work. Uh, so it's not necessarily put that extra burden and stress on Black America to continually do the educating. It doesn't mean that we cannot have a conversation uh, with individuals and teach and try to let them learn about experiences. Um, it's 
very hard pressed to find someone who says they don't know what goes on in this country. You know, that's where have you been? Um, that you, to be honest, to actually say that. So, I believe in, in terms of Black America, we can have the conversation with individuals who may know on an individual level, uh, but it's an incumbent upon white America to do the work and to do the reading that they need to do, and then to go back to their family, to their sister, to their aunt, to their uncle, to their brother, whoever it may be, to try to educate them. Anyone else? Oh, if, if I, I guess to Beverly. Um, I agree with what Brian said, but I think we also, um, as white Americans, we don't need to be complacent, and we don't ever need to believe that we are not racist, because that is just something that that isn't true. Layla Saeed um, wrote a book called Me and White Supremacy, and I'd like to read a really short quote, because I think it speaks volumes. If you believe you are exceptional, you will not do the work. If you do not do the work, you will continue to do harm. Even if that is not your intention, you are not an exceptional white person, meaning you are not exempt from the conditioning of white supremacy, from the benefits of white privilege, and from the responsibility to keep doing this work for the rest of your life. The moment you begin to think that you are exceptional is the moment you begin to relax back into the warm and familiar comfort of white supremacy. If I may also. Uh, oh, go ahead. I'm with Dr. Uh, Littleton and Connolly. The burden should not fall on black people to dismantle the systems uh, that have that white people have, have inherited and who have benefited from it. It's, it's, a, it's an issue for the white community to be organizing as well, and especially, I would say. And I can just tell you from personal experience, I've had Thanksgivings where my uncle said things I didn't like the hearing, and I kept my mouth shut, and I'm ashamed. And uh, I think we have to have some difficult conversations with our own friends, our own families, and, uh, and uh, not be silent or complicit. Okay. So, Doreen, I said I had a question for you that's kind of tied to this. This The question suggested that the power is, is within white America. But I received a text uh, during all of this, and it's asked um, all African Americans to protest with their money. You're in marketing. What would be the impact if African Americans stopped spending money between Juneteenth, which is June 19th, for those that don't know that term, and July 31st, as suggested with the text I received. I think that the impact would be significant, but saying to um, modify your spending habits between Juneteenth, which is celebrating the day that um, we are free from slavery, to July 30th, I think is a very short. It's so when you think about the so the financial impact, even the Mississippi, the bus boycotts lasted for over 300 days. And when they realized and felt the burden of that financial loss, that's when change happened. Right now, African Americans are minority buying power is estimated at 3.9, approximately 3.9 trillion dollars. So to say acting with your money is absolutely essential. So much so that we're starting to see that companies are trying to get ahead of this right now to say, hey, we recognize that we need to do better. I personally have gotten letters from Best Buy um, that said that they are going to look at their own current processes and policies. They're going to establish internal uh, committees and organizations that are cross-functioning teams to look at how they can improve and fill the gaps that they have. The American Marketing Association has also sent out a statement because people recognize that the our skin is brown, but our money is green. And so what's going on in that if you want to continue to have support, then you have to modify what you're doing because we're seeing through the protests, the peaceful protests, and the galvanization of organization because now people are starting to organize. Malcolm X even said one time, he said, we're not out-organized, we're, we're, we're out-funded. 
So not only with the money spending power that we have that generates and keeps the economy going, we're starting to allocate resources to organizations that support this movement. And what's going to happen is we're going to look at and it's going to be put out there for people to say, hey, these companies don't support our this movement. So what you're going to say is then look at diverting those funds to organizations that do. So it would be significant and huge for companies and even damaging to their brand if they don't acknowledge that there are shortfalls and, and do a, a lot of marketing initiatives and awareness campaigns to say, hey, we stand with recognizing what is right and what is fair and what is just. So I have a question here. Did someone else say they wanted to answer that? Okay. I have a question here that says, my son-in-law is a Ugandan black man who has lived in the U.S. for six years. He has commented to me about how similar oppression and incidents occurred in Uganda and in Africa, not specifically because of someone's color, uh, but their tribe or their minority status. Maybe it's the religion or the ethnic affiliation. It comes down to those in power oppressing those who aren't in power. They're asking for someone to comment on that. I guess I can take a little bit of a stab at discussing this here. So um, it is about a power differential, but I think when you start looking at um, different nations within Africa, you can't although you see the ethnic divide, you have to kind of go back a little bit further than that to look at how the effect of colonialism has played a role in deriving those ethnic divisions and who was considered um, what ethnicity was based upon sometimes arbitrary. Uh, and so, and now you've created and divided people, then you, you got to start there. So like, why did even some of these divisions come about? So yes, it is about power, but it, if you step back even further and go back historical, like why did that even power differential begin to exist? And so kind of looking there. If I can also add uh, to that, is, is my mic working? Yes, you're fine. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that race as we understand it today largely is itself an outcome that followed the, the Columbian exchange following 1492. And although not entirely, it's largely a Western hemisphere phenomenon what we understand it as race. And what race is in different parts of the world means different things. And there's many parts of the world that were not colonized, that were not replaced, the populations, uh, that, that did not have an ethnic cleansing event as what happened in what is now the United States and elsewhere in the Western Hemisphere. So if you look in Eastern Europe or in Eastern Africa, uh, that history did happen. And so power, systems of power are defined differently. And as as uh, the questioner uh, mentioned, oftentimes it falls down to things like language, religion, tribe. So the systems are, you know, they're different but similar, I suppose I would say. Okay, I've got another question. Uh, this one will go to, um, I believe, either Haley or uh, the chief. So uh, it's, is psychological testing mandatory for police recruits? Do you know if ongoing psychological testing occurs in connection with performance reviews? Um, let me take that, Haley. So uh, to my knowledge, um, there is no psychological test that is done at the police academy level. Uh, MCOLS, which is a licensing body for the state of Michigan, does require that before you can become a certified licensed officer in the state of Michigan, that you do have to um, go through a psychological exam. Um, once you're hired on though, it's pretty much done. Um, in my experience and talking with a lot of chiefs that I, that I am in contact with around the state of Michigan, um, unless there becomes a problem, uh, there is no random or even like on a, every five year basis where there's additional psychological testing being done. Haley, do you have anyone want to add to that? 
No, you're you're right, Chief. That's my understanding of it as well. And I think, you know, moving forward, like um, the question I answered about sustained change, you know, perhaps those are some changes that will be made and with all different types of ongoing requirements, whether it's based on psychological exams or ongoing um, trainings or ongoing educational requirements. You know, I think that's something that probably MCOLs will, you know, look at moving forward. And so I just to chime in real quick on that. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so speak as a psychologist who does a lot of psychological testing, uh, one of the things that will be that is problematic with psychological testing is it can't screen for that kind of bias. Um, we can look at depression. We can maybe look at those who may have more overt levels of hostility. Uh, but when you start talking about this implicit bias, there's no valid psychological test that we have that will be able to pick up on who is quote unquote the racist or who's going to engage in some of these acts. Uh, so a lot of that um, pre-service evaluation work doesn't necessarily tap into that. And so a lot of the psychological tests that we use, our well, personality tests that we use, um, they're just not, they're not, they were never created for that. And so maybe something there's a field we can look into creating, but there's nothing that really exists in the field that uh, goes toward that. Okay. Um, so I'm going to uh, go to some more police types of questions. And uh, one is about changing the discipline of police, a first strike, a one and done or something. And then there are some statements. Um, the officer that killed Floyd had other cases of abuse. The officer unions need to adopt higher standards. So I'm going to Anybody want to comment on any of those? Well, I can start. Um, you know, I think we kind of addressed that a little bit before that, um, you know, as police departments look at these changes they have to make, um, the power of the union is something that they have to look at. Disciplinary procedures have always been a um, contractual thing that's bargained for within unions. Um, so we have to, you know, look at that power. Do we need to give the unions less power or do we need to make those um, things that we bargain look different in those contracts so that we can't have officers that are, you know, hiding behind these unions? Um, I think a couple of those statements you said, you know, two strikes you're out or something like that. Remember, every department has their own policies and procedures and their own union contracts. Um, so it's, it's very dependent on each individual individual department and how they deal with a lot of those disciplinary issues. Okay, so there's another question and it says, and it's gonna be a statement and a question again. So I've heard many conversations about implicit bias training. Many times it's left extremely general. And while I appreciate the in-depth review of it, can we assure that it actually works? It feels like these conversations have happened before when we talk about Eric Garner, people that other people have had these types of things happen, and that the same cycle keeps repeating. It seems like these enacted anti-racist policies and trainings have been implemented already and nothing has changed. It was even said that Minneapolis had many of these things Chief Michael Odette went in depth about. I've seen arguments claiming that racism, anti-blackness is not something that can be trained out of someone in a few months, and instead is a cognitive behavioral issue. How is MCC going to make sure their training sticks? What are their, consequ yeah, what are their consequences going to be if they breach a policy? So there are three questions in that. It's, does this type of training actually work? How do we make training stick? And what are the consequences if a policy is breached? Do you want me to take that, Dr. Beverly? Who, that would be fine, whoever wants to. So I think, um, you know, as far as does it stick, um, I agree that, uh, you know, we can train and we can train and we can train and we can train and we do it in the academy and we do it um, in service through, uh, you know, department training. Um, but if somebody has got hate in their heart, 
we can train until we're blue in the face and it's not going to fix that. Um, so, I mean, I think we, we determine whether our training works if we see the numbers going down. But, you know, in my case, I work for a department that most of the people that work here are all veteran officers that came, they're working on a second career here. They have been, a lot of them were administrators and supervisors from where they came from. They've got great records. They've got no history of any type of this behavior. Um, so I kind of got it easy. Um, but in the event that we do people see people that are violating some of these policies or work rules, um, discipline's got to happen. And I guess it kind of depends on the level of violation um, you know, we, we might have to start out with the progressive discipline and work our way up. But if, if a violation of a policy or work rule is egregious enough, then termination is your only option. And I, I do think, you know, we talked briefly earlier, um, Mr. Barber and I, about police unions and, and their strengths. And um, I, I think that we do need to look at that. And, and I think the unions, for the most part, are behind the fact that they don't want to have bad police officers. It's not good for anybody. Um, and the state of Michigan has done a pretty good job. Uh, they, they just passed a law here a few years ago that kind of prevents these bad Apple officers from hopping from, uh, department, to bar from department to department by mandatory reporting. So if, if I happen to let an officer go for violation of a policy like this, and they went to a different department, let's say they went to the city of Flint and applied there, when Flint comes to talk to me, I have to disclose why I let him go. And prior to that law being passed, that always wasn't the case. So there are being steps taken to prevent this from happening. Um, but as far as testing whether it works or not, we look at the numbers and see if we're having fewer and fewer complaints. Again, in this department here at Mott, we don't get those types of complaints. But in those departments that do have regular complaints, if they see the numbers going down, obviously that maybe the training's working. But discipline really if in violation of those policies is the only route that we have. And, um, you know, progressive discipline, if it's a minor offense, start out at the lower end of scale. But if it's a, if it's a serious offense, then termination. Anyone else? So a question came in and it asked about, um, what are your thoughts on this panel about defunding police departments? As a social worker, I can tell you that I believe that it's a critical step um, in achieving the type of country that we want, want to have. We have to begin to start investing in people and in, and in communities. Anybody else? Well, I'd like to say, um, agree with Dr. Connolly uh, regarding uh, this here, that we do have, as a person in the mental health field, that we do have to start spending money on the front end. I don't, um, we have to start being more proactive instead of reactionary. The police is a reactionary type of force, and we need to start becoming more proactive. Um, we have to start looking at why are we criminalizing everything, uh, and I feel like a lot of times, no offense to Haley and uh, Chief, but why do we criminalize small infractions like it's a problem in society we don't feel like we can solve? Well, this slap is a crime. For instance, child support payments. You know, like, why are we criminalizing child support where now people have a warrant out for their arrest and interaction with the police? That's not where that should be handled. Um, so we have to begin to look at the policies and decriminalization and look at where we're spending the money. Are our criminal acts still going to occur? Yes, because there are people who are just engaging criminal acts. The police will have a role, but not in the current firm that it exists. I to say I agree with that. When you talk about defunding the police, but I would rather see that we have a different review of the allocation of resources and where those funds are going. So to say to take the money away from the police department is the answer. That's not the answer. What we really need to do is look at how we're allocating those resources, making sure that the police are held accountable. And then if there is a situation with a bad officer or a bad apple, maybe actually having an external 
organization do the review as opposed to the police policing themselves. So just looking at different ways to manage the situation as opposed to saying, okay, let's just take all the, police, the funds away. We still need those resources and to build the bridges between the police officers and the community that it serves. Yeah, I, you know, I agree with the sentiments of my colleagues that um, you guys have just made here. Um, I, I do question um, if it's a knee jerk reaction at this point. So we're saying, okay, defund the police. Well, I'm not sure if any of us really understand what that means. Um, and in law, we talk a lot about passing laws as knee jerk reaction, and then there's a bunch of unintended consequences of that. So I, I guess I question um, some of that part of this idea of defunding the police. I totally agree with spending more money on the front and things like mental health. I mean, if you could understand how many calls the police deal with that are just about mental health issues and really are not a police issue at all. I mean, if we could spend more, more money preventing some of that, um, you know, I think that that would go a long way uh, to help our communities. I just think it's an issue that needs to be explored more before we just decide to make this reaction that, you know, this is what we're going to do. Um, I understand the sentiment behind it that some of these issues are so entrenched in policing. Do we need to kind of wipe the uh, uh, slate clean and start over again and, and rebuild the police, you know, from the bottom up? I certainly appreciate that sentiment, um, but I do question whether, um, you know, it's just a knee-jerk reaction at this point. Anyone else? So um, it looks like so I'm trying to keep the chat in its it's moving too quickly for me. Um, I think one of the questions was talking about uh, having the Confederate flag on our campus and wanting to know, is there a way that we could have a policy against having the Confederate flag? What are your thoughts about having the Confederate flag on our campus? And what are your thoughts about that? Well, I know that the Confederate flag has a different meaning for Black people and white people, for sure. The conversations that I've heard is that some whites say that the Confederate flag is their way of paying homage to their, maybe their relatives that from the South that fought in the war. But what it means to Blacks is that it's a symbol of hatred. It was a war to keep us enslaved. And so when you start to talk about people saying, okay, I'm going to have this on our campus paying tribute to this. You want to pay, have a flag on a campus that pays tribute to enslaving others. And then we have a policy that says that all, that we are, you know, diverse and we um, value equity and we value everyone. And that, so for our ancestors, that's a very painful time that we look at the discrimination and the racism and those people usually a lot of times that are looking and say, oh, this was a great time. Well, who was it great for? Why was this? This is a symbol of honor for you that you wanted to keep our ancestors enslaved to be servants for the benefit of you financially. Like we helped to build an economy and build a country that we didn't benefit from. And so I think that it would be detrimental to have a Confederate flag on our campus, and especially with the population that we serve and the people that, and the community that we serve and what we're saying that we stand for. Okay. So we've had another question to come in um, about holding police officers accountable. Um, it was mentioned that there are different departmental standards and different things in various union contracts. This may be true for work performance. However, what about taking action when the law is broken or legal standards are violated? It seems to me we are talking about more than work rule violations. Can we hold police officers accountable to the law? Absolutely, and should be. Anyone else? Yes, and I think that's, you know, what we're talking about today. They should be held accountable, and we want them to be held accountable. And to my point about we need more people to go out and vote, because remember, you vote for the county prosecutor who's deciding whether to make these charges or not. 
So absolutely, they should be held accountable. If it's something that um, raises to the level of violating a criminal law, 100%, they should be held accountable to the same standards that all of us are, if not higher, because they are sworn to protect the community. They're there to protect and serve. So they should be held to a higher standard than all of us. So yes, and I think if you ask police officers, they'll say the same thing. That's what they want too. They don't want that. So um, the next question is, uh, <laughs> it's about law enforcement experience and where would the demilitarization of the police fall into this situation? And do you think it would work if it occurred? Um, I would speak as a non-police officer, of course. Um, I will say that it may help, but I also look historically that the police didn't necessarily need all that equipment and they still acted the same way. So this same historical pattern of behavior has been going on for a very long time before they even had their first tank that they rolled out with or whatever other former military equipment they're using. So that's only goes so far, it just provides them so to speak, more toys to play with and use, like, oh, we can use it now, but I don't think that would necessarily stop some of the issues that you're seeing because in the 60s, they didn't have that going on, but yet they they just used the dogs in water hoses. I mean, it's the same, so I don't think it requires, it only goes so far. Anyone else? I agree when you're saying they will give them more toys. When we look at, I think um, Brian Harding mentioned what, how the, what the police uh, departments were built on. So I do think that there are some systematic changes. When, they were, when, they were, when there were the slave patrols, there has never been a value on at Black lives. And so when you're saying to give them more, if they have more toys or if they didn't have any toys at all, they still have the same mentality. And so the system, the changes need to be systemic. And so if we want to see a real paradigm shift, that's where the focus needs to be. So there's another question. How do our values support the work of ending racism in society? And how can we engage in a more meaningful way? Nobody's going to tackle that one. Well, if, if, I'll, if I'll jump in then, uh, don't look over your shoulders, uh, speaking personally or to you or to anyone else. You know, uh, this is a moment that we need to seize if, if we're ever going to. And as uh, I believe it was Gandhi said, be the change that you want to see in the world. So there are three more questions on this topic. Addressing systemic racism has to, begun, has to begin early because racism is taught in the home. Even how we empower young Black children, when we raise them to know and understand fear, a necessary evil, and white children are taught fear and hate to our children, it is often from a perspective of scarcity of resources and competition. How does our country's free market system play into continuing this adversarial relations between races? Well, I would like to uh, address that. One of the things that I can say when we're talking about system, systemic racism and how it's passed on from generation to generation. One of the things that's really exciting to see now 
in the protest, the, the peaceful protest that we see that they're very diverse. And there are a lot of young people that are out there that are motivated, that are galvanized, and they are not adopting the same paradigms and thought processes of their parents. They're actually saying, I don't agree, that I, I'm thinking differently. I want to do different. And I think that's something that is good because I'm optimistic about the future generations, especially when we look at around the world, the protesters that are out there, they're young, and there's a history of changes even being done across college campuses. So the fact that we are having discussions like this and that this should be the beginning, not the end, and actually engaging with them, energizing, hearing what they have to say, listening to them and supporting them to move forward. Because there are generations of people that are not going to, modify. there won't be behavior modification for them. But I am optimistic with the young people that are actually going against those traditions that their parents have adopted and standing on the precedents and the premises that they have adopted themselves. And though we talk about um, social media and technology now, that's one thing that has helped the, a lot of the younger people have a voice for themselves where they're actually introduced to thought processes outside of what they see in their own home. Well, outside of talking to their own family, they're being exposed to other perspectives and they're recognizing that there are some flaws and there are some things that they could do different and they are trying to be a part of the change. So the next question, we have moved from religions and teaching love through our schools and many feel put upon in learning about the beliefs and customs of others. How do we begin to repair our system? Dr. Beverly, can you repeat the question again? Just so I can hear it. We have moved from religions and teaching love through our schools, and many feel put upon in learning about the beliefs and customs of others. How do we begin to repair our system? Well, I think we have to teach um, about empathy, right? Empathy for other people. It's something that um, I try to talk a lot about in my criminal justice classes that people have different experiences than you, and therefore you have to see the world from their perspective and their point of view. That as a police officer, if I'm on a traffic stop and I have stopped a black male, their feelings of fear are real, right? So despite you know how I've lived my life or my world, I need to be able to empathize empathize for how they feel and you know that they are scared that something bad's gonna happen right and maybe they've had terrible experiences with the police in the past so maybe there's a reason they're defensive with me you know when I approach them so I just think teaching values about empathy and you know appreciating the differences in people um, is somewhere that we can start at least and so this comment was made I also want to address the violence of retaliation against white people who are trying to defend their property. We have a complete breakdown and fear is not just one-sided. Does anybody want to address that comment? Can you read that one more time? I also want to address the violence of retaliation against white people who are trying to defend their property. We have a complete breakdown and fear is not just one-sided. You know, I, I, I agree that uh, fear is definitely not one-sided. One -sided. When we are talking about retaliation against white people that are trying to protect their property, um, but is that similar to the case that we've just seen with um, Amar Arbery, where someone assumed that he was stealing when he was jogging through his neighborhood, and so they were going to take things in justice into their own hands, and it found that it was unfounded and it was unjust. And so when you start to talk about retaliation against white people, I'm, I'm a little confused when they say they're trying to protect their own property. We, we are talking about the that there are good police out there. And if we believe that the criminal justice system is fair and just, why aren't we allowing the 
justice system to run its course? Why do people feel that they have the right to take it into their own hands and to police themselves and say that I'm protecting my property when we know that there are a lot of times that accusations are unfounded? unprecedented and so we are supposed to be innocent until proven guilty but who's the person so people now are taking judge and jury into their own hands so i think because there has been uh just a, a malicious hundreds of years of malicious uh contempt towards black people and hate that there is fear for from who because we're definitely fear we're fearing from those that are they have to take in the oath to protect and serve. We also know that there are people out there that hate us, that loathe us, that don't even know us just because of what we look like. So to say they're trying to protect the property, well, at one point we were considered their property and they hunted us down to try to protect that too. So I think that the, when you're talking about law being law abiding and enforcing, it should be the same across all uh, platforms, cultures, races, and everyone should be held accountable equally as those that break the law because they say they're protecting their property and that doesn't seem to be true. Again, with the Tulsa, Oklahoma massacre, the young man that was a ch that was accused of assaulting the woman that started the whole massacre that ended up finding out that it was false, that it wasn't true. So I do think that we need to take a look at what people are saying and trying to justify their decisions as before they start to talk about people being retaliated against and being uh, attacked when we were lynched for sport and entertainment. So, you know, that's why. So there's another comment. Perhaps a way to better understand Black rage is to consider the difference in treatment when white people are allowed to carry rifles in the state capitol, shout at police while unmasked during a pandemic, without little to no pushback from the police, while Black people can be killed without being armed or guilty of any crime. So we've got two last questions, and I've got 10 minutes. So first last question is, um, some of our young African Americans are saying they don't have hope. As educators, what should be our response? And I'd like one person to give a response. Sure, I'll take it. Okay. Can you, do you want to, Dr. Polk? Oh, you can. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'll keep it brief, but um, you know, I think this is our job as educators to tell them that you have hope. You are our future. You are our answer. You are living in a pivotal moment in history and you have a chance to make a difference. You know, um, Brian mentioned Gandhi's quote, be the difference, be the change you wanna see in the world. Um, I, I talk to my students, some are shying away from professions in criminal justice, right? Because they see how broken they view the system. Go into it, right? Become an attorney, become a judge, be the difference, make the changes, right? Go into politics, um, you know, speak out, do your research, vote. Uh, I think in times of darkness sometimes is when the brightest light shine through. Um, so I would say you have nothing but hope and we are here to guide you, to help you, but you are our future and you are our hope for all of us. Dr. Pope. Dr. Pope. Uh oh, I was just gonna say that there's always hope and we see that in the, all of the young people who are taking a stand nowadays and they're helping to fight against this cause and they're protesting and they're walking and they're demonstrating and they're doing it peacefully. So there's the hope. Look at the younger people who are hopeful that they can make a change. And as educators, it is our responsibility to help, you know, ignite that hope in people. And it will continue as long as we help make that a choice for them. And this last question, uh, it, we've gotten a couple of questions that uh, kind of went in with the question that we had on here uh, that was a prepared question. So I, I would imagine everybody has an answer to this one. So I'm going to ask all of you, all the panelists, um, and very briefly share what steps can we take at MCC to self-examine and determine our biases? 
the question that was written was, what more can we do on campus to allow for open discussion of the issues of race relations in our community, which the greater community, as we all know, is our campus family? So these are your last thoughts, and we have seven minutes. So I'm going to start with Brian, because I see you, Brian Hardy. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I guess I had an answer. So yeah, <laughs> I wasn't avoiding it. Uh, first of all, we need to recognize that we all are biased. That's ingrained to the nature. That, that's just human nature. Uh, we've been living uh, before agriculture and before what we call civilization and writing. Uh, we lived in small bands of hunters and gatherers, and we were taught to work within our tribe and to attack others. Uh, that's just who we are. And so it takes work to deprogram that. And I haven't even gotten into slavery yet when we discuss this. So we need to be aware of our biases. And incidentally, uh, Harvard University has a really great implicit bias test. And everyone can test yourself to see what your biases are. And I think that, should, that could be a good step one. Okay, Doreen. What we need to do is we can have these difficult conversations, but I do think that we have to set some ground rules that we have to be respectful and inclusive of others' perspectives that may not necessarily agree with our own. Um, as educators, we need to support our students, actually listen to them and hear what they're saying from their perspectives. Because from what we have, as Brian said, we all have our own biases and our own lived experiences, but to listen to our students and provide the support and resources for the things that they also find value in and uh, just allocate the, the time, the effort, and not let it look great on paper, but it be something that we live and have that's fluid and that's really happening on our campus. Haley? Yeah, I agree. We have to recognize that these bias exists. We have to have, you know, more open conversations like this. Hopefully one day when we're all back on campus together, um, you know, involving our students as well. Um, having these tough conversations uh, within the classroom, I think, is, you know, a fantastic exercise. I often tell my students, if we can't talk about this stuff in the classroom, then where can we talk about it, right? This is your safe space to talk about these issues. Um, and we, we absolutely have to listen to each other, listen to the experiences of others because that's the only way you can develop um, those empathy skills. Um, Brian Littleton. So um, some of the things that everybody already mentioned, we have to examine our own biases. We also have to look at our, the privileges uh, that individuals have. And then also one of the other things we have to look at is intersectionality, which I know we didn't get a chance to discuss, but looking at intersectionality and how that intersects with um, in terms of um, sexual orientation, gender, some of those other issues as it intersects in different levels of oppression. So we have to kind of look at the, all the different systems together, but it just starts with looking at our own biases and our acknowledging our own privileges is the first step. Denise Polk. I would agree with everyone, everything that has been said, and also have students look at our civility policies that we have here on campus. We have a whole committee that looks at, you know, being civil toward each other. And so you have to, you know, when you examine your own biases, also look at how you're being civil and how you are um, displaying that civility to your fellow students and faculty. Dalton Conley. I think we need to hold each other more accountable. Um, and, you know, I agree with what everybody said about having the hard uh, conversations. Sometimes in class, we hear things that uh, are hurtful, that are wrong. It's easy to let it go, but we have to be the one that sets the example, be the one that steps up to the plate, be the one that says, here's another way to think about that. Um, if we don't do it, who's going to? Rodney Barber? No, well, outside of the home, we as teachers have the greatest impact on students. Um, we see them in a the classroom. We see them maybe after class. Um, well, before we got the teaching online, 
we would see them in the hallways, walk down the hall and talking to them, talk to them uh, during office hours. We can have a major impact on students exhibiting good behavior and correcting or, or at least trying to influence, influence in a proper way some bad behaviors that we see. Um, it's, it's just such a powerful impact that you can have on students. I mean, I know as a black person, before we had uh, the doors closed, and I looked in the hallway and sometimes I'd see black students staring at me in the hallway and why were they staring at me? They never saw a black teacher. And, you know, subtle things and major things can have a huge impact on students. Chief Odette. Uh, we are committed to providing our Mott family with the most professional, uh, most ethical and um, diverse policing that we can possibly offer to you. Um, you have my commitment that as long as I'm here, we will continue to do the important training and de-escalation and ethics and uh, dealing with uh, diverse groups of people. And you have our commitment that we will work with all the stakeholders in our community to address any issues that pop up, that we need you just as much as you need us. And we're here to work together with you. Well, I want to thank the panel for being honest, open, and transparent as they shared with us um, really so much good information and that can really help our college to move forward. As I close, I wanna read something to you. Um, I was in a meeting um, last week, uh, early last week on Tuesday. And while I was sitting leading the meeting, I started getting a flurry of texts. And I picked up my cell phone and it said, good evening. I was thinking today about the protests and I remember the time I was held at gunpoint, leaving my neighborhood in Newport News, Virginia. I was a senior in high school and on my way to play basketball. I was going to the base, which is near my house. And as I left the neighborhood, I noticed a two-door Saturn driving very slow in front of me. I passed the car and I got in front of it. We met at the red light that's at the end of the street of the neighborhood, and all of a sudden they flashed their lights and they told me to pull over. Upset and confused, I lowered my car window and I started to get my wallet. Before I could get the wallet, the plainclothes officer had approached my window and he had already had his weapon drawn and he pushed it to my temple. He told me to get out of the car before I could speak, and he handcuffed me. His partner, who was black, was talking me down because I was very angry, and he told me, just calm down. Everything's going to be cool. The officer searched my car up and down, trying to find anything that they could, but they found nothing. They took off the handcuffs. And the officer said he thought I was reaching for a gun when I grabbed my wallet and that I should, have al I should always have my hands in plain sight when pulled over. He then said a cop had been shot there a week before and he was on edge. He said I was following too close to his car and he let me go without a ticket or a warning. I never said anything to you because I didn't think it would do any good. I thought my mom would be very upset and she would sue them or she'd get mad at me for driving and take my car. I didn't know that things like that happen too often and that too many black boys get killed because of it. One of my friends even saw me get handcuffed and I was just honestly happy that I didn't get a ticket. I thought I was lucky. I didn't do anything but I made sure I had my hands in sight the next time I got pulled over, which was often in our neighborhood that we lived in. 
But I realized today that I have to share this with you because I felt that my grandfather, what he would have felt about what was happening because he knew that the same things were happening when he came home from World War II and was not being able to be served in diners while in uniform just because he was black. And I can only imagine what other family members have had to deal with. I just wanted to share because it was on my mind. I'm going to protest today because I feel my grandmother, my grandfather would have done it if he were here. So I share that with you because I'm the mom that was not told about any of this happening 10 years ago in the neighborhood. I knew nothing about it until I read it on a text that he decided to share. I was upset and I was very emotional to know that this had happened to my son. It was a, a moment to take a step back because it could have gone all wrong and I could have been one of the mothers without a child. And so I bring that forward because I want you to know it can happen to any of us. And sometimes we know, and sometimes we don't. And the one thing that I take assurance of is that because everybody knows my story, I raised him as a single black mother that I knew I could not be everywhere. So I prayed that God would put a fence around him and wherever he was, that he would take care of him. And I know that that's what happened that day. And so I challenge us as a college to remember this can happen to anyone. It's happening to our students. It's happening to our family members. We have had many people to share. And it's time that we really start talking about how to make a difference so this stops. I thank you again for listening. I thank you participants for being here and sharing your stories. And I know that Mott Community College will take the lead in ensuring that on this campus, we will not have that kind of thing to occur, but it's gonna bleed out so that it doesn't happen in this county, which then bleeds out so it doesn't happen in this state, which then bleeds out so that it stops in this nation. So thank you very much. I appreciate you being here. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.